بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ہیلو اینڈ ویلکم ٹو لیکچر نمبر فورٹین آف الجبرائک ٹوپالوجی اور ٹوڈیز لیکچر از دا فرسٹ ان دا سیریز آف لیکچرز وی ول بی ریویو سم ٹرمینالوجیز فرام ہومولوجیکل الجبرا سو ان پرٹیکولر ان ٹوڈیز لیکچر وی ول ریویو سم بیسکس آف رنگز فیلڈز اینڈ ماڈیولس سو وائی ڈو وی نیڈ ہومولوجیکل الجبرا سو ایز یو ریمبر دیٹ وین کیلکولیٹنگ دا سمپلیشل ہومولوجی Uh, we used objects or sequences like this so the objects of these sequences are free abelian groups and the morphisms are boundary maps now of course if we need to calculate uh, simplicial homology more efficiently then we need to understand these objects more precisely and for that we need tools from homological algebra so uh, the objects as I said earlier are free abelian groups Uh, but uh, every free abelian group is a module over the ring of integers so in general uh, we discuss the more general framework of uh, sequences where the objects are R modules where R is a ring and uh, the maps are basically R module homomorphisms okay so uh, now we need to understand sequences like this okay so uh, starting from our very first definition so uh, what is a ring a, a ring is a set together with two binary operations of addition and multiplication okay so as you remember that uh, we have already seen the definition of binary operation so what is a binary operation so in particular if I take uh, um, this set R to be Z uh, then a binary operation is a function from Z cross Z to Z okay uh, but I need two binary operations in this case so one we are calling it addition and the second we are calling it multiplication so I need two maps from Z cross Z to Z as uh, you can guess easily uh, that uh, uh, I can easily find such binary operations on the set of integers uh, of course uh, I can define them to be ordinary addition and multiplication so uh, I need uh, one a from this z and another integer b from this z and I want my answer to be another integer okay so the output of this function should be an integer so I can define it to be a plus b and if a and b are integers then the answer is going to be an integer so this is a good binary operation so this is a binary operation that we are going to use uh, when we'll be uh, proving that z is a set of integers so this is a binary operation uh, on the set of integers and similarly we can define uh, another binary operation on z in other words I can define another way uh, of defining this map z cross z to z so given two integers I can define uh, an operation on a and b such that their answer is also an integer of course we can define them to be multiplication of a and b so we have uh, two binary operations on the set of integers so uh, these, these are not the only binary operations on the set of integers uh, of course we can define many other operations or many other binary operations on the set of integers okay so uh, given two binary operations uh, on the set R uh, we want them to satisfy the following three conditions and if these three conditions are satisfied then we say that the set R is ring under these two binary operations so the first condition that needs to be satisfied is R under addition is an abelian group and the second condition that needs to be satisfied is that under multiplication uh, this should satisfy the associative law and uh, uh, in the last condition we require that multiplication should be distributive over addition from the both sides okay so uh, let's start with our first example uh, we have already seen that uh, the set of integer z has two binary operations of addition and multiplication uh, so once again uh, we can define other binary operations as well so in this uh, particular example we are considering the ordinary addition and multiplication so uh, let's see if it satisfies the first condition so we want uh, uh, this uh, addition to be closed we have already seen that this addition is closed so addition is closed in Z 
so the second condition is uh, it should be associative so if I add three numbers in any order then there will be no change in the answer so we can say that as Z under addition satisfy the associative law so uh, why so what is the what is the important consequence of this uh, associative law so uh, I, I can write down integers 2 plus 3 plus uh, let's say 10 so uh, as you can see that I haven't used any parenthesis so it is due to this associative law that I'm not using the parenthesis because uh, this associative law says that I can add 2 and 3 first or I can add 3 and 10 first there will be no change in the answer so that's why I don't need parenthesis when I'm writing down let's say 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 up to so on so oh, even in expressions like this uh, I don't need parenthesis uh, because I can add these integers in any order and there will be no change in the answer so uh, in the third case I need to find uh, additive identity so of course uh, 0 belongs to a set of integers such that a plus 0 is equal to 0 plus a is equal to a and uh, this holds for all a belongs to Z okay so we can say that uh, Z has additive identity so uh, we are calling it additive identity because uh, uh, if we change the binary operation then this uh, identity will be changed so that's why we are uh, adding another prefix uh, with the word identity that additive identity because this is the identity under this operation of addition and in the fourth condition I need to check that for any integer uh, there exists an element such that when I add that element into this A from either sides then I should get 0 uh, of course uh, we can guess that given any number 2 then there exists an element minus 2 such that when I add this number minus 2 into 2 from either sides from either of the sides the answer is always 0 and uh, the same thing can be done for any integer so for a belongs to z there exists minus a belongs to z such that a plus minus a is equal to minus a plus a is equal to zero okay so these four conditions imply that z under addition is group now if you remember the conditions of the, the ring we want this uh, z under addition to be a billion group so in the fifth part we check that uh, if this uh, operation of addition is uh, commutative or not so in other words a plus b is equal to b plus a or not for all a b belongs to set of integers okay so uh, we know that we know set of integers so we know that I can add uh, two integers in any order and there will be no change in the answer so all these conditions imply that z under addition is a billion group so the first condition of the definition of ring is satisfied so uh, let's go to the next condition now we need to check that the operation of multiplication is associative or not so in other words if I uh, multiply three integers in any order uh, then there will be no change in the answer and uh, once again from our uh, uh, working with set of integers we know that I can uh, multiply 2 into 7 into 8 in any order and there will be no change in the answer so uh, once again I'm not using any parenthesis in 2 into 7 into 8 uh, because uh, if I add 7 into 8 first and then multiply it with 2 or if I multiply 2 into 7 and then multiply it with 8 then there will be no change in the answer so that's why I don't need parenthesis when I'm writing down the multiplication of integers and in the third part I need to check that uh, multiplication is distributive over addition or not so in other words I need to check that if I add B and C and then multiply the answer with A and uh, it should be the same as A into B plus A into C and uh, from the other side 
I need to check that if I add a into b and then multiply the answer with c then it should be the same as a into c plus b into c and uh, once again from our working with set of integers we know that these properties hold in set of integers so all the conditions for the ring are satisfied by this set of integers under this uh, binary operation of addition and multiplication so this imply that z under this uh, usual addition of so under this usual uh, binary operation of addition and multiplication is a ring Okay, so uh, consider this next next example. We have a set of real numbers under usual operation of addition and multiplication. Then this forms a ring. Uh, okay, so uh, once again, R under addition is a billion group. So that's our next condition to be checked. And uh, in the second condition, uh, we need to see that. Uh, this R under multiplication is associative or not okay and in the third condition we need to check that multiplication is distributive over addition from both sides okay of course uh, we need to see that a cross b plus c is equal to a cross b plus a cross c or uh, and we also need to check that a plus b cross c is equal to a cross c plus b cross c so uh, I'm leaving this as an exercise for you that all these conditions are satisfied by this set of real numbers under this binary operation of addition and multiplication so this implies that R under this usual operation of addition and multiplication is a ring. Now uh, let's consider another example. Consider the set of all M, N cross N matrices with entries from set of real numbers. Then this forms a ring under this usual matrix addition and multiplication. Okay, so uh, for simplification of the calculations, uh, consider the case when N is equal to 2. Okay, so uh, let's see if this set uh, M2R, set of 2 cross 2 matrices with entries from set of real numbers, uh, under this usual operation of addition is a group or not. Okay, so take uh, 2, 2 cross 2 matrices A1, A2, A3, A4. Uh, let's call this matrix A. And uh, let's take another matrix B, uh, B1, B2, B3, B4. Okay, now uh, A plus B is equal to A1 plus B1, A2 plus B2, A3 plus B3, A4 plus B4. Now uh, this addition A plus B is a 2 cross 2 matrix, we can see that. A1 plus B1 is a real number because A1 and B1 are real numbers and similarly all the entries of this matrix are real numbers so we can say that this is a 2 cross 2 matrix with entries from set of real numbers so is it's an element of M2R so addition is closed in this set of 2 cross 2 matrices now uh, let's see the third con second condition okay so in the second condition we need to find additive identity in this set so as we can guess easily that 0 0 0 so the 0 matrix belongs to uh, M to R and uh, it satisfies uh, the condition that if I add a any matrix into this 0 uh, and uh, this 0 plus a and the answer will be still a and so this matrix uh, this 0 matrix acts as additive identity in this set M to R now uh, let's see the third condition uh, so uh, let's say a is remains this one and b remains this one and uh, let's consider another matrix c with c1 c2 c3 c4 uh, now it's an easy exercise to check that a plus b plus c is the same as adding a plus b first and then adding the answer into c so this operation of addition defined in this way is associative and in the last 
condition we need to see that given any matrix A there exist additive inverse of this matrix A uh, so given this matrix A we can define this matrix minus A given as minus A1 minus A2 minus A3 minus A4 such that when I add A plus minus A then as we can see that when I add A1 into minus A1 then I will get 0 and similarly I can add A2 into minus A2 and the answer will be 0 and similarly I can add A3 into minus A3 answer will be 0 A4 plus minus A4 answer is 0 so this is basically 0 matrix so corresponding to every matrix A belongs to M to R there exists a matrix minus A which satisfy this condition and uh, we can uh, also see that minus A plus A is equal to 0 0 0 0 as well so these uh, conditions imply uh, that M to so 2 cross 2 matrices with entries from R under addition is a group now we also need uh, another condition that this uh, operation of addition should be uh, commutative as well and uh, once again it's an easy exercise to see that A plus B is equal to B plus A and given uh, for example take this A to be this and B to be this matrix and uh, uh, add them and then uh, basically the commutativity of addition in the set of real numbers imply this condition okay so the first condition uh, of uh, the ring is satisfied now in the second condition uh, we need to see that the set of matrices is associative under the usual operation of multiplication so in other words when I multiply B into C first and then A or I can multiply A into B and then multiply it with C then there will be no change in the answer and in the third condition uh, I need to check that A into B plus C is equal to A into B plus A into C and uh, it's distributive from both sides so I also need to check that A plus B into C is equal to A into C plus B into C so uh, I'm leaving uh, this as an exercise so take A to be this matrix B to be this matrix and C to be this matrix multiply B and C and then multiply it with A and then multiply A and B and then multiply it with C and see that the answer should be equal and similarly add B plus C multiply it with A from this side and multiply A with B and uh, A with C and then add them then you should get the same answer and similarly uh, we can prove this last result as well so uh, take these three general matrices and prove uh, these conditions okay so uh, uh, the computations uh, can get a little tedious uh, but uh, there will be no non-trivial tricks involved so uh, this proves that uh, m to r set of two cross two matrices with set of real with entries from set of real numbers is a ring under this binary operation of addition and multiplication now consider this set of polynomials in uh, one variables x with real coefficients okay so um, what is the general element of this set so a n x is to power n plus a n minus 1 x is to power n minus 1 uh, up to so on plus a 1 x plus a naught okay so where these a i's are basically real numbers okay so uh, this is a general element of this set and uh, now uh, we can add uh, two polynomials and uh, we can multiply two polynomials and uh, uh, basically I'm leaving this as an exercise for you that uh, this set R of X set of polynomials uh, in one variable X and coefficients from R is a ring under this usual operation of addition and multiplication now consider this uh, another simple exercise uh, that uh, set of 2 cross 2 upper triangular matrices with real number entries is a ring under this operation usual operation of multiplication and addition of matrices so what are set of 2 cross 2 upper triangular matrices so these are matrices uh, of the form this a b c 0 
and where the entries a b c are real numbers and uh, we can add any two matrices like this so a1 a2 a3 0 I can add these two matrices uh, b1 b2 0 b3 and uh, the answer is going to be a1 plus b1 a2 plus b2 a3 plus b3 okay and uh, 0 plus 0 remains 0 so that's why still uh, addition of two upper triangular matrices uh, is uh, again going to be an upper triangular matrix and the entries are going to be real numbers so operation of addition is closed and similarly uh, we can check the other conditions uh, of the ring and uh, we will see that uh, this set of two cross two upper triangular matrices is basically a ring now uh, in the definition of the ring we know that uh, this uh, operation of addition should be commutative because R under addition should be uh, an abelian group now it is not clear uh, in the definition that uh, uh, of course it is not required in the definition uh, that R is commutative under multiplication or not but if this extra condition is satisfied then we say that R is commutative so whenever we say that R is commutative ring uh, we don't mention uh, the binary operation because we already know that under the operation of addition it is commutative so if this extra condition is satisfied that it is commutative under the binary operation of multiplication then it is commutative ring so uh, we have already seen uh, that the set of integers is a commutative ring so why this is a commutative ring so why it is a ring we have already seen it and uh, why this is a commutative ring so a dot b is equal to b dot a so in other words when I multiply in for instance take uh, 2 into 3 it is the same as 3 into 2 so uh, multiplication of integers is uh, commutative I can multiply them in any order and there will be no change in the answer so we can say that the ring of integers is a commutative ring now uh, consider this example of n cross n matrices with entries from real numbers it is not commutative so why it is not commutative take for instance uh, to simplify the computations uh, take for instance n is equal to 2 and uh, take this set a to be 1 2 3 4 and uh, take this set b is equal to for example 1 7 11 20 okay so uh, if you multiply a into b and then multiply with b into a uh, then uh, you will see that most probably uh, you will get the answer they are not same okay so uh, in general uh, if I take so I have taken a very particular example of A and B okay uh, so in general if I take any two matrices then their multiplication is not commutative okay so we can say that uh, the ring of uh, n cross n matrices under usual operation of addition and multiplication and entries from set of real numbers is not a commutative ring the set of real numbers is a commutative ring uh, because we know that in set of real numbers again if I multiply any two numbers for example a into b it is the same as b into a so for example uh, take uh, for instance pi which is a number multiplied by 3 it is the same as 3 into pi okay so it is commutative uh, under this uh, binary operation of multiplication so once again uh, this ring we also we always require that the ring is uh, commutative under the binary operation of addition but we don't require in the definition that uh, it should be commutative under this binary operation of multiplication so when the binary operation of multiplication is commutative we say that it's a commutative ring now consider this set of uh, uh, two cross two upper triangular matrices with real number entries so now this ring is basically not a commutative ring so once again uh, it's an exercise for you to check uh, or to find two upper triangular matrices such that a into b is not equal to b into a so can you find such a and b okay so um, most probably if you take any A or any B and they will satisfy this property that A B is not equal to B A 
unital ring. So a ring R is said to be unital if there exists a non-zero multiplicative identity which satisfies this. So uh, once again, uh, in a ring, we require that there are two binary operations. So under one operation, uh, it is a billion group. Okay, so we, call, we are calling that operation to be addition. So uh, in that binary operation, or under that binary operation, R has identity. Okay, so we can, we can call it additive identity. But uh, R under multiplication is not required to have a multiplicative identity. So whenever this extra condition is satisfied, uh, then we say that our ring is basically unital ring or ring with identity. Okay. So for example, uh, consider this ring of integers. Uh, we have already seen that it is a commutative ring. And now let's see that if it contains uh, identity or not. So uh, there exists this element 1 such that z into 1 is equal to 1 into z is equal to z. So this is satisfied for each and every integer. So we can say that z is a commutative ring with identity. Now uh, it's a little exercise for you to find other examples of unital rings or rings with identity. Now, uh, starting with our next definition of a field, a field is a set F together with two operations of addition and multiplication. So, it's called a field if it satisfies the following three conditions. So, number one, it should be uh, a billion group under addition and the non-zero elements of F should form a billion group under multiplication and the multiplication should be uh, distributive over addition from both sides. Now can you uh, find examples of field? Uh, of course uh, we can uh, find many examples of field. Uh, for example, the set of real numbers under ordinary addition and multiplication is a field. So we have already seen that this uh, set of real numbers is a ring. So what is what is what are the extra conditions that needs to be satisfied if we want to show that this is a field. So uh, the first condition is satisfied because it is common in the definition of ring and field. So F should be a billion group under addition. We have already seen that R is group uh, under a billion group under this binary operation of addition. So the first condition is satisfied. What about this uh, second condition? We have already seen that set of real numbers uh, minus zero or set of non-zero real numbers uh, under this multiplication. So this multiplication is closed in that uh, R minus zero. Okay, so, so the first condition is satisfied uh, that uh, this multiplication is closed in R minus zero. So in other words, if I multiply any two non-zero real numbers, then I will get a non-zero real number. Uh, what is the second condition that needs to be satisfied? So uh, this multiplication should be associative. So once again, uh, this is common condition in uh, the definition of field and the definition of ring. So this is associative. So what extra is required over here? So now we are also requiring that it should be uh, it should have multiplicative identity. Uh, of course, it has multiplicative identity because we can take one uh, which belongs to non-zero real numbers. And uh, if I multiply R with one from any side, then I should get R. So this one is basically multiplicative identity. And uh, in this second last condition, we need to check that every element has multiplicative inverses and that's the condition uh, that's why we are uh, basically requiring that we should have non-zero real numbers or in general in the definition of field non-zero elements from this f okay so because we know that if i add uh, zero into r then uh, uh, zero doesn't have any multiplicative inverses so that's why we are taking this zero out so if i have any non-zero real number then uh, there exists 1 over a which uh, also belongs to r minus 0 uh, such that when I multiply a with 1 over a from either sides then there is no change in the answer and the answer is always 1. 
so this uh, uh, set of real numbers set of non zero real numbers uh, has inverses as well and in the last condition i need to check that uh, if i multiply any two real numbers in any order then there'll be no change in the answer and uh, this is uh, very trivial to see that from our understanding of the real numbers it is clear that i can multiply real numbers in any order and there'll be no change in the answer so uh, these are the extra conditions that needed to be checked in order to see that uh, the ring of uh, real numbers is also a field and uh, we can see that these conditions of distributive laws of multiplication so multiplication is distributive over addition or not from either sides this is common in the definition of ring and field and we have already seen that uh, uh, this multiplication is distributive over addition in the set of real numbers so uh, these were the extra conditions from the definition of ring and they are satisfied by this uh, set of real numbers and we can say that the set of real numbers is a field the set of integers is not a field since it does not contain multiplicative inverses of many elements okay so uh, when we say many elements it means almost every element does not have a multiplicative inverse and the only element which has a multiplicative inverse is basically one because the inverse of one is one itself so one into one is equal to one so uh, any other element let's say two uh, has multiplicative inverse one over two which does not belongs to set of integers similarly any other integer for any other integer 1 over a is not an integer so 1 over a does not belong to z so uh, z under this ordinary addition and multiplication is not a field so another example uh, which is a field is a set of complex numbers so under the ordinary addition and multiplication it is a field and uh, once again i am leaving this as an exercise for you uh, to check that the all the conditions of the field are satisfied so uh, for example c under this uh, ordinary addition is a billion group c minus 0 so take out this 0 under this ordinary operation of multiplication is a billion group and in the third condition i need to check that uh, the multiplication of complex numbers is distributive over the addition of complex numbers okay so in other words uh, this condition a cross b plus a cross c is satisfied and of course uh, from the other side as well so a plus b cross c is equal to a cross c plus b cross c so all these conditions are satisfied so uh, we have already seen uh, that uh, we require some extra conditions uh, when we are uh, requiring uh, that uh, when a ring is a field so so what's the relationship between rings and fields so a commutative ring if we have a ring and if we require that it should be commutative and it should be it should have identity and every element every non zero element is invertible so under these conditions rings and fields so they are the same okay so uh, you can say that if we impose the extra condition of commutativity containing an identity and ha having every non zero element to be have inverse in that set then ring becomes a field now uh, let's begin with our uh, next important definition that will be needed in our future discussions so that's the definition of module so uh, given any ring not necessarily commutative neither containing identity a set m is called a left module over r if it satisfies the following conditions so in the first condition uh, this set m uh, should be a billion group under this binary operation of addition and secondly uh, there should exist a map r cross m to m and uh, we call uh, this map action of r on m so take uh, an element r from r and take an element m from m and uh, they act like r into m so basically you multiply r on m from the left side okay so and if it satisfies these following conditions so if you uh, closely observe these conditions then we are requiring that mm, this uh, uh, operation so uh, this action of r on m okay so it is distributive over the addition of the ring R 
okay so this uh, this r and s so these are elements of the ring r and this addition is basically addition of the ring elements okay so that's why we are saying that uh, this operation uh, of uh, action of r on m so this is distributive over uh, the addition of ring and similarly uh, this operation is distributive over the addition of module as well okay also uh, this uh, uh, sort of associative law this special associative law is satisfied so in this case uh, if you multiply uh, r into s which are elements of the ring because uh, in the ring we have two binary operations addition and multiplication so if you multiply r into s and then uh, this uh, act this on m or you act s on m and then r on m, on m or on sm then there will be no change in the answer okay so if r is a ring uh, with the identity then we require this extra condition that 1 into m is equal to m so if you remember uh, the definition of a vector space over a field uh, then you will realize that uh, these are exactly the same conditions that we that we require uh, that when a set is a vector space over a field okay so the only difference is uh, of course a ring may or may not have an uh, identity or multiplicative identity so when r has an identity then uh, uh, this also satisfies this fourth condition so in general a module uh, need not to satisfy this fourth condition so this uh, this is this is required only when r is a ring with identity so uh, if we ignore uh, this sentence then these are exactly the same conditions so one two three four so we require all these four conditions on uh, a set to be a vector space okay so uh, if you uh, realize uh, that uh, uh, if you know what is an action uh, of a group on a set uh, then uh, you will see that uh, it satisfies the definition of action so that's why we call it action of r on m so but if you don't know uh, what is action then uh, you don't need to worry about it because we are not going to use it in future but uh, we are just going to call uh, this operation as action of r on m so uh, the module is called left module because uh, we multiply the ring elements on the left of elements of m we can uh, define right modules on the similar lines okay so uh, of course in that uh, uh, definition we will uh, define and this action in this way that m into r now let's see uh, under what conditions a left module becomes a right module okay so uh, if r is a commutative ring okay uh, then we can convert a left r module into a right r module by defining m r into r is equal to rm okay so uh, of course uh, if we are defining a right r module then we need to define this action in the following way so this goes into m into r so basically we are multiplying the ring elements on the right of m okay so uh, how do we define this so uh, we have we have already have a left r module okay so this m is left module so if it is a left module then we already have uh, an action and it satisfies all required conditions so now we define uh, this operation in the following way that uh, so basically we don't know what is m into r but we define it in this way that this is equal to r into m and how do we know what is r into m because uh, this is left uh, multiplication and uh, uh, we know that it exists and it satisfies the condition of the module because m is a left module so we define m into r is equal to r into m okay so why do we need uh, commutativity so if you look at the definition of uh, module then uh, each and every condition will be satisfied so uh, m under addition will remain an abelian group okay so the only thing we are changing is, is this uh, action and the first condition will be satisfied the second will be satisfied if r is a ring with identity and then the fourth will also be satisfied and the only thing which will create disturbance and or which will require commutativity of the ring is this third condition 
so let's see if this third condition is satisfied or not so what is this third condition so we should have r into s into m is equal to r into s into m but then this is the condition if uh, it is a left module so what do we need to show so we need to show that r s into m it is the same as m r into s so that's what we need to show and uh, how do we define m into r this is equal to r into m so if we don't uh, use commutativity then we can't prove that this holds and uh, i'm leaving this as an exercise for you uh, to see that but uh, uh, let's assume commutativity and show that this property holds so if this is a commutative ring then r into s is equal to s into r so i'm going to write it s into r okay so uh, by definition that uh, we are defining this uh, action m into r is equal to r into m so basically this is equal to s into r into m and uh, using uh, this property uh, because m is a left module so i can write it down as s into r into m okay now uh, i can write down this uh, uh, r into m as because uh, according to this r into m is the same as m into r so i can write down m into r and once again uh, this is an element uh, of the set m and not r because uh, according to the definition uh, if i operate uh, m into r uh, which is equal to r into m then this is again an element of m so this is an element of m and uh, basically i can define it as m into r into s so uh, why because uh, we know that we are uh, defining s into some element of m is equal to element of m into s okay so uh, basically we are using this condition m into element of uh, r is equal to that element of r into m so basically using this condition element of r into element of m is equal to element of m into element of r okay so uh, using this condition and uh, as you have observed that uh, we have proved uh, this condition okay uh, but uh, if you assume that uh, r is not commutative then uh, if you start from uh, m into r into s then uh, this is equal to m okay so sorry r into s into m okay so because we are defining it like this okay so uh, and using uh, this condition this is equal to r into s into m and uh, which is equal to r into m into s because uh, once again using this condition that uh, 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 ring element multiplied by m element is equal to uh, the other way so multiplying uh, m element with ring element so and this is equal to m into s into r so you can see that that's not uh, we require we require that it should be equal to m into r into s but this is m into s into r so that's not we need and uh, in other words if r is not a commutative ring uh, then a left module is not a right module okay so only if r is commutative then we can re define uh, action uh, the right action m into r is equal to r into m and uh, using commutativity all the conditions are satisfied so it becomes a right module so unless otherwise specifically mentioned modules are always assumed to be left modules so uh, if f is a field and v is a vector space over f and uh, since every field is a ring we have already seen it uh, so we can take uh, the ring r to be f and uh, by comparing the axioms of vector space on module we see that v is a module over r so as i have said earlier that in the definition of module so we are requiring exactly the same conditions as the conditions or the axioms of vector space uh, of course uh, if r is uh, a ring with identity then they become exactly the same so uh, in other words we can say that a vector space is also a module over its base field 
now consider uh, a ring r with identity and take a positive integer and define this set r n to be a1 a2 an so uh, just to be clear that this r doesn't mean set of real numbers it is just a ring with identity okay so we define this set rn to be a1 a2 a, an and these ais belongs to this ring r so once again this r doesn't mean set of real numbers this is any ring with identity so now we can make rn to be into an r module so the r module rn is called free module of rank n so how we can make rn to an r module of course we need uh, uh, to check all the conditions of the module so in the first condition we need to check that rn is a billion group under addition so we can define addition to be a1 a2 up to an plus b1 b2 up to bn is equal to a1 plus b1 a2 plus b2 up to so on an plus bn okay so we can define uh, addition like this and uh, we can check other conditions uh, for example it is associative and uh, so this addition is uh, associative in the next condition we need to check that there exist uh, 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 additive identity uh, so of course it's a ring so it's a billion group under addition so it contains additive identity so i can take a zero 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 to be my additive identity in this new structure rn and uh, why this is additive identity because i can add this uh, this uh, element into any other element in any order and uh, there will be no change in the answer and the answer will still be that element a1 up to an so this is an additive identity and uh, in this fourth condition i need to check that given any element a1 up to an and there exists an element minus a1 up to minus an such that when i add these two elements in any order then the answer is zero so why minus a up to minus n belongs to this set rn because it is a ring which is a, a billion group under addition so given any a1 belongs to r there must exist minus a which is the additive inverse of a1 inside r which is a ring okay so uh, this minus a1 is the additive inverse of a1 inside this ring r similarly the up to so on minus a n is additive inverse of a n inside this ring r so i can uh, define this minus a1 up to minus a n and this must belongs to the set r n and when i add these two elements uh, in any order okay so adding these two elements in any order then the answer will remain zero 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 and uh, so for any element there exists an additive inverse and similarly i can uh, see that uh, uh, this operation of addition that we define in this way is also a uh, commutative uh, so why it is commutative because the ring uh, under addition is commutative so using that property uh, we can see that this is uh, commutative so taking any two elements a1 up to an plus b1 up to bn so this is the same as b1 up to bn plus a1 up to an so using once again commutativity of r under addition uh, we can uh, show that this new operation under uh, inside rn is commutative so uh, the first condition that this rn should be uh, a billion uh, group under addition is satisfied so it is a billion group and uh, in the next condition i need to define an action of r on rn okay so i need to define a map r cross rn sorry this is r okay to rn okay so how do we define this map so take uh, uh, an element a of this r and take an, a, a tuple a1 up to a n from this rn and uh, we define this map as multiplying a a1 a a2 up to so on a a n so since r is a ring so it is uh, closed under this uh, binary operation of multiplication so that's why a a1 a a2 a a n are all elements of r and so that's why this belongs to r n sorry this is not the real numbers just any r n 
okay so uh, we define this uh, action of r on r n and uh, now we need to check that uh, the, fo uh, the all the four conditions because uh, in this case you know, this r is a ring with identity so we need to check that fourth condition as well so all the four conditions are satisfied so i'm leaving this as an exercise for you to check that one two three and four conditions so these four conditions are satisfied okay, so one two three four so these four conditions are satisfied uh, for this set rn and uh, so it becomes an r module every abelian group is module over z conversely every module is an abelian group okay so uh, it's a very important exercise because as i have said earlier that we are going to deal with mainly with abelian groups and every abelian group is a module over z okay so z is a ring we have already seen it and uh, uh, we have an abelian group so uh, let a be abelian group okay so uh, the first condition of module is automatically satisfied because the first condition requires that we should have an abelian group under a binary operation of addition so whatever the binary operation of this uh, uh, abelian group is we say that uh, that's our addition that we require in the definition of module so in other words uh, if a is uh, let addition be a binary operation of a so the first condition is satisfied and uh, according to the first condition a under addition uh, should be a billion group and it is a billion group so there is nothing to show because it is already given that it is a billion group so uh, let's see how to show the second condition in the second condition i need to define an action of z on a so in other words uh, take an integer n and an element of a i need to define an operation n a okay so we define n a in the following way okay so uh, let's see uh, roughly what is the main idea uh, behind this action so if a1 is an element of this abelian group a since it is abelian so a1 plus a1 should also belong to a similarly a1 plus a1 plus a1 should also belong to a okay so now we can call this a1 plus a1 to be 2a1 and we can call this a1 plus a1 plus a1 to be 3a1 similarly we can define up to so on n into a1 where n is any positive integer okay and we can define 0 into a1 to be equal to 0 of a and if n is negative for example if n is minus 1 then minus a1 is additive inverse of a1 because a is a billion group so it must have additive inverses so we take that additive inverse to be minus a1 okay so in other words minus a1 so minus 1 into a1 is minus a1 and definitely it belongs to a because a contains the additive inverses of its elements and a1 belongs to a so minus a1 belongs to a similarly uh, i can define uh, minus a1 minus a1 uh, belongs to a because uh, this is also closed under uh, addition and minus a1 belongs to a so minus a1 minus a1 which i am taking as minus 2 into a1 and similarly we can define m into a1 uh, which belongs to a where m is a negative integer okay so we can define uh, this action for every integer positive negative and zero okay so uh, how do we define this so this is equal to a plus a up to so on plus a and n times okay n times if n is a positive integer and we define it at zero if n is zero okay and uh, we define it as minus a minus a up to so on minus a and 
mod of n times if n belongs to z negative so that's how we define action of z on a now uh, we need to check that uh, this action satisfies all the conditions so uh, for example we need to check that the first condition uh, that uh, uh, n plus m into a is equal to n into a plus m into a okay so uh, of course this is satisfied so uh, for example if i take this n to be equal to 10 and this m to be equal to 11 so what we are trying to say that if i uh, add a 21 times then it is the same as adding a 10 times into uh, adding a 11 times okay so this n into a means uh, writing down a plus a plus a 10 times and this m into a means writing down a plus a plus a 11 times and uh, if we add them together then this becomes 21 times a and uh, which is definitely equal to uh, 10 plus 11 21 times a so uh, this is uh, trivially true and in the second condition we need to check that if i multiply this a1 plus a2 where a1 plus a2 are elements of this abelian group okay so over here a is an element of a and uh, m and n are integers so similarly uh, this is equal to a1 plus a2 a1 plus a2 uh, so how many times n times okay so a1 plus a2 n times and uh, uh, once again since a is a billion group so uh, we can use the a billion property and we can say that this is equal to a1 plus a1 up to a1 plus a2 plus a2 plus a2 n times okay so this is equal to n into a1 plus n into a2 so the second condition is also satisfied and similarly we can uh, prove the third condition that n into m into a is equal to n into m into a uh, so once again using the same uh, tricks we can show that this third condition is satisfied now this uh, ring z uh, is basically a ring with identity so it must also satisfy the fourth condition that uh, 1 into a is equal to a into 1 is equal to a which is trivially true because we are uh, 1 into a means adding a one times and a into 1 means adding a one times so this is equal to a okay so uh, let's go back and uh, see if all the conditions are satisfied so of course these are satisfied so that's why we call uh, this uh, a billion group a z module and conversely why every module is an abelian group uh, very trivially in the definition of the module we require that set to be an abelian group so that's why every module is an abelian group so we can say that abelian groups and z modules are the same things so whenever i'll use the word uh, consider this z module it is the same as saying that consider this abelian group Let's consider another example. Uh, if R is a commutative ring with identity, then R can be regarded as a module over itself. So how can we do that? So uh, basically, R is a uh, commutative ring with identity. So R has two operations of addition and multiplication. So R under, multi uh, under addition is already an abelian group. And uh, we can define uh, this action of R on itself as R. In, so let's say R1, R2 goes to r1 r2 so uh, using this uh, action and using this property we can easily see that this is a module over itself now uh, another simple example is sub module what is a sub module it is just a subset of the module m which is a subgroup as well and which is closed under this action in other words if i take any element of r and any element of n then r n should belongs to n so remember we have uh, uh, an action of r on m and if you take any element of r and any element of m uh, then uh, this r into m should belongs to m but now uh, if i have uh, a subset n of m then it must also satisfy this condition that if i take any element uh, from this set and any element from the ring then the multiplication uh, the special multiplication should also belongs to 
n. So if these conditions are satisfied, then we say that this is a submodule. Now coming to our uh, next important definition of R module homomorphisms. So if uh, we have a ring and uh, M and N be R modules, then a map is R module homomorphism if it respects the R module structures of M and N. Okay, so uh, what is the structure of R module? It has operation and it has that uh, special action of R on M. So this R module homomorphism should respect those two operations. So when we use the word respect, it means that if I add uh, two elements in M and then operate uh, phi on them, it should be the same as operating phi on one element and phi on the second element and then adding them. So basically uh, this phi respects this operation of addition. So you can uh, apply phi first and then add them later or you can add them first and then apply phi later. There should be no difference. And similarly, uh, this operation of uh, action, so if you operate phi on r into x, uh, then it doesn't matter uh, if you apply phi on x first and then multiply with r, or you uh, operate r on x first and then apply phi, then there should be no change in the answer. Okay, so if these conditions are satisfied, then we say that it is a r module homomorphism. So uh, there will be uh, some elements of m which will be mapping to 0 in n. So n is also a module, so it must have additive identity. So all those elements of M which are mapping to 0 of n, so they belong to kernel of phi, and of course this kernel phi is contained in M because these are all the elements of M. So for example, if this is M, then uh, this kernel of phi, and uh, uh, let's say this is N, so all these elements are mapped to 0 of n. So each and every element of this set uh, goes to this 0 of n. Okay. And uh, what is the image of phi? So the image of phi are all those elements of n which are images for some m of n. So uh, once again, uh, so this m, so this m goes to some subset of n in general. Okay, so let's say this is the subset of N. Uh, so this set uh, is basically a set of image values of phi and of elements of M. So apply phi on the elements of M and uh, we in general we get a subset uh, of N. So this subset of N is called the image of phi. So if R is a field, then R module homomorphism is a linear transformation. So we have already seen what is a linear transformation uh, of vector spaces. So uh, for example, uh, consider this following linear transformation. So uh, let's see if it respects the uh, operation of addition and uh, multiplication or the action of R on itself. Okay, so we need to check that uh, if Okay, so take two elements, let's say x1, so let's call it u, x1, y1, and another element v, which is x2, y2. So what do we need to check? So we need to check that t of u plus v is equal to t of u plus t of v. So that's the first condition. So uh, let's see if it's true or not. So what is t of u plus v starting from this side? So t of u plus v is equal to t of x1, x, y1 plus x2, y2, which is equal to uh, t of x1 plus x2, y1 plus y2. So uh, this is equal to, so when you op uh, operate T on any ordered set, so uh, uh, any ordered pair, so this is equal to uh, adding them and then multiplying the first uh, ordinate with 2. Okay, so uh, let's add them, so x1 plus x2 plus y1 plus uh, y2 and then uh, in the second ordinate just write down 2 into the first ordinate, so this is equal to 2 into x1 plus 2 into x2 so uh, this is equal to x1 uh, plus uh, y1 and uh, x2 plus x2 plus y2 
and 2 into x1 plus 2 into x2 so i can uh, write this down in the following way x1 plus y1 2x1 plus x2 plus y2 2x2 so basically this is image of t of x1 y1 plus this is image of t of x2 y2 so uh, basically which proves that t of u plus t of v so it respects so this uh, uh, map t respects the operation of addition so we can say that the first condition is satisfied similarly we can show that if i have uh, some element r uh, of a set of real numbers and uh, x1 y1 so i can show that this is equal to r into t of x1 y1 so i am leaving this as an exercise for you uh, to check that the second condition is satisfied and since these two conditions are satisfied so we can say that this function t from r2 to r2 is r module homomorphism if uh, we have an abelian group a and we know that uh, abelian group a is a z module and uh, we define a map phi from a to a given as phi of x is equal to 2x then uh, uh, we need to check that if this map is r module homomorphism or not so the question is phi is z module homomorphism because over here our ring is z so z uh, module homomorphism so once again we need to check that it satisfies all the conditions of r module homomorphism in other words we need to check that uh, phi of x plus y is equal to phi of x plus phi of y so let me show you the first condition so and i'll leave the second condition to you so phi of x y is equal to 2 into x plus y so of course i can write it down as x plus y plus x plus y because that's how we define uh, 2 into x so that's how we define the action okay so uh, so this is equal to x plus x plus y plus y so why this holds because uh, this is an abelian group so this is equal to 2 into x plus this is equal to plus 2 into y so this is equal to phi of x plus phi of y so the first condition is satisfied similarly you need to check that phi of n into x is equal to n into phi into x where n is any integer okay so uh, we can say that this phi is basically z module homomorphism so what is an isomorphism an r module homomorphism is an isomorphism if it is bijective if it is we have a ring r and uh, m be an r module and n be a sub module of m uh, then the additive abelian quotient group m quotient n can be made into an r module by defining an action of elements of r in the following way so uh, the first condition is uh, we know that uh, m is basically a billion group under addition and if we have a sub module then it is also a subgroup of n and uh, so it will also be a billion so uh, if we have uh, a billion groups then of course n is normal inside n and so we can define m quotient n so uh, i suggest you to look at my first lecture if you don't remember uh, the names of normal and the quotient group so uh, this is allowed so m quotient n is allowed and what are the elements of m quotient n so the elements of m quotient n are x plus n where x belongs to m and now i can convert so this proposition says that we can convert this structure m quotient n into an r module so of course uh, this m quotient n is an abelian group so once again according to uh, the results of group theory that we uh, saw in first lecture so this is an abelian group uh, now the next thing we need is r action so the action of r on m quotient n so how do we define this action so r into x plus n so once again what is x plus n an element of m quotient n so we define this action r into x plus n is equal to r into x plus n so r into x is well defined because m is an r module so x is an element of m so r into x makes sense okay so 
uh, that's how we define and this uh, R module M question and is called question module uh, the natural projection map M goes to M plus N so what is this projection map so give me an element of M and I'll give you X plus N so this X plus N of course is an element of M question N so uh, this projection map is an R module homomorphism with kernel is equal to N so the only elements which will go to zero are basically elements of n and uh, what is zero of this new structure m quotient n uh, is basically equal to this x n so it's a proposition and uh, uh, we are excluding the proof of this proposition so as a particular example uh, we can take this n to be n z and m to be m z and uh, this quotient module uh, consists of uh, of course elements of this form and uh, we can also uh, say that this z quotient and z consists of equivalence classes of mod n now we have our next important result which will be used very extensively in our further discussions so it is the first isomorphism theorem for modules if we have two modules m and n and uh, an r module homomorphism between them then the result says that this kernel of phi is a submodule of m and m quotient kernel of phi is isomorphic to phi of m so we know what is kernel of phi we know how to define quotient and we know what is isomorphism of r modules and uh, phi of m is the image elements of uh, phi inside m so uh, once again we are not doing the proof of this result but if you are interested then you can uh, have a look at uh, any uh, book on modules so as an example uh, consider this m is equal to rn which is free module of rank n and uh, uh, take this m n to be equal to r and uh, define this map pi 1 r1 r2 up to rn is equal to r1 just the first uh, ordinate of uh, uh, rn then pi is homomorphism so i'm leaving this as an exercise for you to see that why pi 1 is a homomorphism also pi 1 is subjective uh, once again given any element of r there exists an element uh, r up to any element so uh, for example if a is an element of r then i can take this element a r2 up to rn such that the image of uh, this is equal to a so it is subjective and the kernel of this is given as 0 r2 r3 up to rn so uh, just the first co coordinate should be 0 and the other coordinates should be any element and so this will be the kernel because uh, when we apply pi on this element we will get 0 because I am only getting the first coordinate and the, all the coordinates are ignored so in fact kernel of pi is isomorphic to free module of rank n minus 1 that is isomorphic to r n minus 1 so by the first isomorphism theorem for modules uh, this rn which is this uh, domain and uh, uh, quotient with kernel what is kernel in this case rn minus 1 should be isomorphic to phi of m but in this case it is subjective map so phi of m is equal to total r so this should be isomorphic to r so that's uh, one application of uh, first theorem of uh, uh, first isomorphism theorem for modules but uh, in future we will see many other applications so uh, our next definition is direct sum of modules so how do we define direct sum of modules uh, so we just uh, you know so we just take the cross product of m1 m2 up to mk and uh, we define addition like this and the action of r on this uh, new uh, module like this and uh, under these two operations uh, this direct sum is basically our new module so uh, given for example uh, z and uh, i can take uh, m2 to be z as well uh, so i can take the direct sum of z into z so this becomes a new z module okay because z is a z module as well so i'm taking this z as a z module and m2 as a z module and this z plus z the direct sum is also a z module so uh, as another example uh, take a field then kn is basically a direct sum of n copies of k once again uh, take this uh, cross product of k n times and uh, we can define addition and multiplication uh, uh, in the usual way 
of point-wise addition and uh, so for example k1 up to kn plus m1 up to mn so we define the point-wise addition kn plus mn and we define the multiplication as k1 up to kn equal to rk1 up to rkn okay so under these two operations this becomes a module so uh, finitely generated module so uh, uh, these kind of ideas uh, run very parallel to uh, the ideas that we discussed in group theory so it says that uh, if we have a set x inside m then the smallest uh, submodule of m containing that x is basically the submodule generated by that x or in other words we can say that uh, the intersection of all submodules of m containing that set x is called the submodule generated by that x and uh, if uh, we have a set x and such that the smallest uh, submodule containing that x is m itself then m is generated by x and if uh, the elements of x are finite then we say that m is finitely generated module so uh, as a simple uh, result we have this uh, thing that uh, we if we have a left module uh, over some ring with identity then the submodule of m generated by some finite subset of m consists of all elements of the following form okay so uh, uh, the proof of this is very simple because uh, if we have uh, a some module containing these elements uh, then r1 x1 r2 x2 r k x t k should also belongs to that sub module let's call it n and because it's a sub module and uh, so the one side is very simple that uh, every element of this form belongs to n now conversely uh, if uh, every element of this uh, form belongs to n then n obviously is basically a module okay so i'm leaving this as an exercise it's a very simple result uh, as a next example uh, we can uh, say that if we have a free module of rank n which we have already seen that it is rn once again r is not real numbers r is any rank Okay, uh, we can take these elements e i is to be 0, 0, 0 and 1 at the ith position then any element of R n can be written in this form. So we can say that uh, this uh, module m which is module free module of rank n is generated by these elements. Okay, so uh, once again we have seen many things like this when we uh, discuss vector spaces. So uh, last but not least we have this uh, definition of free module so uh, an R module M is said to be free on a set subset A of M if for every non-zero element X of M there exist unique non-zero elements R1 up to Rn such that this element X can be written in this form. Now uh, uh, this looks very very similar to finitely generated modules so uh, that's why we have included this uh, example of difference between uh, uh, generators and free generators okay so the difference between a finitely generated module and free module because uh, if you look at the definition uh, then they look very similar uh, but uh, if you uh, observe the for example the definition of free module there is this word unique non-zero elements r1 up to rn such that x is equal to is this form but uh, if you look at the definition of uh, finitely generated modules then uh, in this result we haven't required uh, that these r1 up to rk are unique so we just said that for some r1 up to rk okay so uh, in particular if we consider this m to be z2 plus z2 so the direct sum of this z2 so what are the elements of uh, z2 so these are uh, 0 and 1 so these are basically uh, congruence classes or the equivalence classes of mod 2 function now the set A which is equal to 1, 0 and 0, 1 which is of course contained in this uh, module M generates M because every element can be written as a combination of elements of A that is of this form. Okay, So uh, for example if you consider 0, 0 then it is equal to 2 into 1, 0 because 2 into 1, 0 is equal to 2 
into 0 and this 2 is basically 0 in z2 so th this is equal to 0 okay so uh, plus 2 into 0 1 okay so uh, that's why uh, this element 0 0 uh, is can be written as combination of a1 and a2 but this is not a unique combination as you can guess many other combinations uh, where uh, I can multiply some scalar with 1 0 and some other scalar with 0 1 and the answer will be 0 0 but m is not free on a since the elements of m cannot be written uniquely in the above form as the elements r1 r2 are not unique so uh, for example i can write down 1 0 as 3 into 1 0 okay similarly i can write down 1 0 in as 5 into 1 0 so the expression of 1 0 is not unique uh, and uh, there does not exist unique r1 and r2 the elements of the ring so in this case is z so they are not unique integers uh, such that these elements of m can be written uniquely as r1 a1 plus r2 a2 so that's the difference between finitely generated module and free modules so in particular if i have z then the free module on the set a is called free abelian group okay so if uh, the cardinality of a is n then the free abelian group has rank n and it is isomorphic to this and the definition of free abelian group that we did in our first lecture when we were discussing uh, the group theory uh, is compatible with our uh, this definition okay so these two definitions are compatible so that's the end of our lecture next time we will uh, uh, continue our discussion of homological algebra with the topic of short exact sequences this is the end of the lecture thank you very much and allah Hafiz.